Good afternoon. My name is Norman Sandfield. Today we're down here in the vault at the Heard Museum in Phoenix, Arizona. We are preparing a book and an exhibit on Bolo or Bola ties for the centennial celebration of the statehood of Arizona, which is coming up on February 14th in the year 2012. This is the official state neckwear in three states, Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas. Most people think of the bola tie or the bolo, as it is more popularly called these days, as a simple item, an element, a decorative element or ornament here on a braided leather cord with decorative tips, sometimes elaborately decorated. But the story is much more complicated. For an art form that's only 70 years old, various stories are still being told and discovered. The official line is that in 1949, a rancher in Wickenburg, Arizona named Victor Cedarstaff went out riding. And in his ride, he dropped his hat and he protected the neck band, the hat, excuse me, and he protected the hat band by throwing it around his neck. He got compliments on it and he went home and he created this bola tie. Uh, actually, a lot of people take credit for creating the bola tie. And I think more accurately, earlier to Victor Cedarstaff, the credit goes to a lot of unknown Navajo artists who turned out very simple pieces like this. It's silver and turquoise. And here's a different version on the braided leather cord. Other people took jewelry, in this case Zuni jewelry, and this is a little Zuni ring. Somebody snipped the back of the band and folded the pieces in and made a bola tie out of this, a common practice at the time. Actually, many bola ties or bolo ties um, were made from elements that could have been used as pendants, as brooches, as rings, as bracelets, and the front element is identical across several pieces of jewelry. The man who gets credit for being the first, officially the first Native American, is Bernard Dawahoya, who it is said in 1956 made a bola tie. This is one of his later pieces, a very popular design. He made quite a few of this uh, cornstalk piece. As the bola developed, it was found in different tribes, in different groups, in different places across the country, uh, different materials. Here's a beaded piece. And we have a walrus ivory piece from Alaska or the Northwest Coast. Notice that the tips are carved eagle claws um, and decorative as well. A match set, of course, is much nicer than just throwing a commercial cord on a piece. Some of them are large and showy, as this piece would be if worn. Other pieces are large and showy in a completely different way, as this beautiful square dancer is. For several decades, um, this is just common jewelry made in classic styles. In around the 1980s, artists took off on their own. They started to do creative things. This cotton bowl with the cotton bales as the tips is a good example of this. Here is another piece of artistic level bolo. Notice also a new invention. The cord is much thicker and heavier. Most people, when they buy the bolo tie, buy it for the decorative ornament. Other people will tell you to look at the tips or the cord to judge quality. But the other place that we've learned to look is the back. This is what is known as a figure eight fitting. It's easy for an artist to make in his studio out of simple wire. The more complicated story is the Bennett clip. This clip is named after its creator, Mr. Bennett. Unfortunately, he's still mysterious and unknown. He worked out of California, made these one at a time, and the text on it reads, Bennett, patent pending, C31. 
He never applied for that patent, thus he never got it. What the C-31 refers to, nobody knows. Over the years, the C-31 was dropped, eventually the patent pending was dropped, and then the text was dropped entirely. Today, many of these are made by individual artists in this style, and they're made in China as well, as a lot of other fittings. There, are, there is a patent uh, from Tulsa, Oklahoma. Mr. Day and Mrs. McKenzie, a father and daughter, patented this fitting. It's a push button. And it, you know it's patented because it actually has the patent number on it. And they made two different versions of it, two different sizes, to house two different thicknesses of cords. Many of these are made for tourists and visitors or collectors. Some of them have stories. Here is a piece in remembrance of POWs and MIAs in the Vietnam War. Uh, we don't know who made it or who they made it for, but somebody who cared. Most bolos and bolas come from the American Southwest, classically silver and turquoise. But art knows no borders, and Mexico has produced a tremendous number of diverse bolo styles. We have two here. And the good news about Mexican bolos is that they are usually stamped on the back like British silver and other government-controlled art forms so that they are uh, well documented. Here is another piece from Mexico with a bended clip and on front is a wonderful cow playing a guitar. More recently, we see some beautiful inlay work. And notice the tips, also inlaid, matching in theme. The artist took more care with that. And fish, here we are in the desert, looking at a beautiful bolo of a fish that's caught on a hook and instead of the line going straight up as it would in the real life, the artist has wrapped the hook in the line around the edge of the fish to make it a compact piece. The Hopi are famous for their Hopi inlay work. And we have two beautiful pieces of Hopi inlay here on the table. Uh, this is two layers of silver. The top level is cut out. The back level is darkened and then they are assembled. And so you see the contrast with the dark showing through the cutout areas. Some artists, you can tell their work a mile away. This is a famous piece by Victor Beck, uh, a classic piece. Some of them are inlaid, some of them are plain, some of them are gold, some of them are silver, but it's a Victor Beck design that's well known. On a separate note, I think it's interesting to note there are four Native American art forms that were created during the 20th century. The bolo tie, the silver seed pot, the storyteller doll, and glass as an art form. All of them new to Native Americans adapting to a new marketing system. From the simple to the complex, bolos come in all shapes, forms, sizes, and price ranges. This Zuni inlay piece was rewarded with a ribbon at one of the American Indian markets. Uh, by, it's by Shirley and Virgil Ben, and you can see the detail, the time, the work, the inlay, the carving it takes. This is a masterpiece, something that somebody would enjoy owning, and more importantly, and from my point of view, enjoy wearing. This wonderful piece is by Norbert Peschlakai a renowned contemporary artist. It was made after a visit to Chicago where he was taken on a tour of Chicago outdoor art. He saw the Picasso sculpture in the Civic Center and came home and made what I call a Picasso-esque piece with the angular designs of Picasso. And it is now a beautiful bolo that even Norbert Peschlakai 
fans might not recognize immediately, but when they do, they say, oh yes, of course, because he does go to these extreme levels of creativity. He was inspired by something he saw in Chicago. I love it. Here is where two of those new art forms intersect. This is Northwest Coast artist Preston Singletary, famed for his glass work. This is a commission piece after seeing his show here at the Heard Museum. I decided that I needed a Preston Singletary bolo. And it took more than a few days, but they were up to the challenge, and this face was made for me. It is slightly difficult to photograph because it's clear glass, but it is unique, and it is special because it's different, and it shows the artistic options that a good collector and a good artist can come together and have a fabulous piece of art that's wearable. I think the important message here is that these are wonderful collectibles. They're even more beautiful when you're wearing them. You get to show off your taste, your knowledge, your bank account maybe, and you get to go up to other people and say, oh, you have a nice bolo. Have you noticed a nice bolo I'm wearing? Many bolos tell a story. Sometimes the story are very native in design. Uh, sometimes we know them, sometimes we don't. Here is a bolo made for Pat. Who Pat was, we do not know, but he or she once owned this beautiful bolo and it's now part of the collection. Other stories, and a little bit more humorous, are those of football teams, these two football helmets. Uh, one with the Colts on it, and this inlaid turquoise piece here, another football helmet, made for a sports fan, obviously. Another beautiful piece is this rabbit. And it's one of those things that the artist has taken the same time and the trouble to do elegant tips. It shows that he cared. The old, arguably the oldest piece on the table is a recently made piece, but the material is old. This is dinosaur bone a beautiful material when polished like this, set in a very elegant and simple setting, it makes a very elegant statement. No complexity, just an unusual discussion point for those who say, what is that material you're wearing? I hope you've found this as interesting as we have. The show opens at the Heard Museum November 19th, 2011 and will go well into 2012. The book will be available at the same time. And of course, you can always find more information on the museum's website, www.herd.org. That's spelled H-E-A-R-D. Thank you for listening.